Hello and welcome to this digital service brought to you by the East Solent and Down Circuit in the south of England. We continue the Lenten journey on this, the second Sunday. We hope that you will find this time of sharing helpful. Thank you for joining today. Where there is bold print on the screen, you are invited to join me in saying those words. Barbara Hayward will read our Bible readings. An opening prayer. God of Abraham, we come before you as children of your inheritance. Through the generations, we have numbered more than the sand of the shore and the stars of the sky. We bring you our worship as we stand in the grace of God found in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first hymn is Come, Now is the Time to Worship. Come, 
just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God. Come, 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 come. And a prayer of praise. To you, O Lord, be praise and glory for the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ over death and hell. In him we are more than conquerors, for he has called us into eternal life. Lord, make us worthy of our calling that we may serve you in love and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, now and for ever. Amen. And we continue in prayer as we share some verses from Psalm 22, starting at verse 13. I will tell of your name to my people. In the midst of the congregation will I praise you. Praise the Lord, you that fear him, O seed of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, O seed of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the suffering of the poor. Neither has he hidden his face from them, but when they cried to him, he heard them. From you comes my praise in the great congregation, I will perform my vows in the presence of those that fear you. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord shall praise him. Their hearts shall live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall bow before him. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. How can those who sleep in the earth bow down in worship? Or those who go down to the dust kneel before him? He has saved my life for himself. My descendants shall serve him. This shall be told of the Lord for generations to come. They shall come and make known his salvation to a people yet unborn, declaring that he, the Lord, has done it. Amen. A prayer of confession. We recognise that we have failed God and our neighbours. We confess that we have fallen from the life that is offered to us through the death of Jesus Christ. We acknowledge that the love of God is rescuing us from sin and restoring us to grace. In testing, hardship and suffering, may we be willing to offer all that we are and all that we have to be followers in the way of Jesus Christ. Amen. A moment of silence for our own confessions. The Apostle John says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Thanks be to God. Amen. We come now to our Bible readings. From Genesis, a moment when God promised his faithful servant Abraham that he and Sarah will have a son. Their future descendants will become a great nation and the Lord will be their God forever. And in the gospel, Peter cannot bear to hear what Jesus is saying about his destiny. But Jesus teaches that just as his way was one of suffering for the sake of others, so for all who follow him, 
selfishness must be renounced and we must each take up our own cross. Our first reading is Genesis chapter 17 verses 1 to 7 and 15 to 16. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty, walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. God also said to Abram, As for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. Our second reading is Mark chapter 8 verses 31 to 38. Jesus predicts his death. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. You cannot be serious. I don't believe it. Two passionate exclamations of incredulity, which were very much part of the language. In the 80s, with John McEnroe sounding off, when the Wimbledon umpire called against him, and dear old Victor Meldrew in the 90s sitcom, One Foot in the Grave. Perhaps we have all used such phrases at one time or another when something has taken us by surprise. Be it negative, as those two were, as Abraham and Peter in the context of our readings, or positive, as we see maybe when someone's lottery numbers come up. Some things are just too much to take in on first hearing and the words just tumble out in a sort of reflex action. For Abraham and Sarah, way beyond childbearing years, 
The promise of a son and generations of grandchildren to outnumber the stars in the sky was seemingly just not possible. Sarah laughed at the suggestion, and yet it did happen. Isaac was born. God's promise came true, and Abraham's faithfulness, acceptance and obedience, his keeping the covenant, are what he's most remembered for and commended for, and are an amazing example to us all. As Paul says later, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. And then Peter, at this turning point in the Gospel, as Jesus moves from teaching and healing around Galilee to the journey to Jerusalem and his fate, having only just acknowledged him as Messiah, the chosen one of God, and been commended by Jesus for this spiritual insight, Peter just can't handle the news that Jesus has just shared. That he must suffer and be killed in order to fulfil his destiny and bring salvation to the world. Surely he and the others were now expecting that Jesus would take control and assert his authority over the Roman oppressor and the Jewish leaders. And I can just imagine him saying, you cannot be serious. But after rebuking him, Jesus enlightens him, saying that he's seeing and thinking from a human perspective and not as God sees things. Isn't that the way we think too? Jesus has a different way of upsetting the status quo and accomplishing his Father's will. And Peter and all who choose to follow him must learn it. It's only in the light of the resurrection that understanding really begins. And with the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, the real drive to share the good news comes and the courage and strength to face whatever the world threw at him, which for Peter himself was ultimately, so it is believed, crucifixion. As we know, crucifixion was routinely used by the Romans to execute enemies of the state, those who upset the smooth running of the empire, who rocked the boat, stood up against injustice and challenged those in power, a cruel, humiliating and agonising way to die. And the condemned did have to carry their own crosses, at least the cross beam. So Jesus' challenge is not to be taken lightly, Many have suffered and died for their faith. Tragically, many still do. At the beginning of Lent, we're reminded of Jesus' temptation as he spent time in the wilderness. This ends with the devil leaving Jesus and biding his time. And having been outsmarted by the Lord on all counts, waits for other opportunities. Not for the first time in three years then, the tempter has returned. Here, subtly using Peter's attempt to persuade Jesus to choose a less dangerous road as one such opportunity. But once again, Jesus counters the challenge in his robust and authoritative rebuke of Peter. And what he says next is for all of those who are listening. Anyone who wants to follow him, Jesus says, must be prepared to die, to take up his cross, a huge challenge. It's interesting to note, and I'm not sure I'd picked this up before, but the first talk of crosses in Mark's Gospel is of those of Jesus' followers, ours, not the one he himself will have to carry. To what lengths are we prepared to go? How far are we prepared to stand out from the crowd and perhaps be considered enemies of the state in standing up against those things we believe to be wrong or in witnessing to our belief in Jesus and the fact that he gave his life for the whole world in the face of opposition 
and persecution. Tom Wright likens Jesus' declaration here with riot police preparing to confront a rebellious mob, or fire or lifeboat crews responding to an alarm, going toward danger, not knowing what the outcome will be, but prepared to face it, whatever the consequences, in order to save lives, and in the case of the riot, diffuse violence. We may not be challenged to the point of death, but we must be prepared to face whatever comes. We may be criticised, ridiculed, or just plain ignored. But didn't Jesus say that would happen? It happened to him, and he doesn't call us to go through anything he's not been through himself. In John 15, he says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. In his letter to the Galatians, chapter 6, Paul says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. So, as a Christian community, we can share the load of carrying our crosses. After his rebuke to Peter, when Jesus speaks to all who are gathered, perhaps he's emphasising the importance of community, of working together mutually accountable in honesty and responsible for one another, caring, sharing and journeying together. As individuals, as well as the specific challenges of discipleship, we each have crosses of varying weight and size, issues in our lives with which we struggle, perhaps illness, pain, bereavement, relationship or financial difficulties, concern for family, and so on. And we need to recognise that sometimes someone else's burden is heavier than our own and gets too much to carry. Even Jesus fell under the weight of his and needed someone, Simon of Cyrene, to carry it for him for a while. Taking up our cross means putting aside selfishness and self-interest and living out our faith in Christ, no matter what, in his strength, for his sake and to his glory. Amen. Our next hymn is From Heaven You Came.
we come to our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. We pray for all followers of Jesus Christ, for those who suffer and are imprisoned for their faith, for those who serve as missionaries, for teachers of the faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who deny themselves to serve others, for those who work in hospitals and prisons, for those who are carers, for those who serve their communities as volunteers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who carry the weight of a cross, for the homeless and unemployed, those who are ill or bereaved, for those who struggle with mental health. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for ourselves as we follow Christ, for strength to overcome our struggles and failures, for our fears and worries, for those we love and those who love us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn is When I Survey the wondrous cross. Oh, thorns compose so real. 
lying crimson like a robe spreads o'er his body on the tree then am I dead to all the globe and all the globe Living God, go with us on our journey of discipleship. Grant us faith to follow you where you might lead. Courage to step into the unknown, grace to walk with humility, and commitment to travel to journey's end. So may we take up our cross, follow in the footsteps of Christ, to his praise and glory. Amen. Thank you.